Hello there. Hi, yes, you, you clicked on the video. You, it's interested you. So I'd like to say hello to all my subscribers, non-subscribers, friends, trolls, bots, and lurkers alike. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Or if you're watching in the future, I hope it's better than what it is currently today on June 23rd of Wednesday, 2021. So, about this, about Enoch. Not many people know about the book of Enoch, and are only just finding it. And also, not many people know that there were two Enochs, and there's a bit of confusion around what goes on. So I'd like to share some information. I would like to step outside the Bible in order to step back into the Bible. Well, sort of something like that. I'd like to start by stating these three basic principles that I believe the most important here would agree with. The Bible was written by ancient people of a different time, culture, and mentality than us. We know and understand that there are many things we struggle to understand in the scriptures because of this fact. And because of this, we take to the study of ancient writings, people, and times. But, as we know, not everyone does this, sadly. The battle continues over the opinions on creation account in the book of Genesis. Studies in the writings from the surrounding nations at the time period of the writing of Genesis give scholars insight into the types of writing styles and languages used for the period. Through this, alternative meanings can be discovered for words we thought we understood already. The same principle is applied to our study of scripture elsewhere. We have to understand the culture and its uses of phrases, idioms, and terminology in order to understand what is written in scripture at the time. I take a look at one piece of influential literature and ancient writing that you have probably heard at least the name, its name, the Book of Enoch. I hope to show you this writing, which was lost or ignored by the church for nearly 2,000 years, it was actually a key influential writing that had a big impact upon our New Testament scriptures. Now, when it comes to the discussion of extra-biblical literature like this, people tend to have different reactions. Mention something like the Apocrypha, sorry for saying it wrong, to a Protestant, their instinct would be to raise their fist in preparation for a fight. When you bring up Jewish writings that come from a biblical period, people either simply ignore or dismiss them as useless or simply deny they contain any truth at all and think instead that they contain an error or a myth. We may hold the inspiration of scripture and we believe all scripture is true, but such view does not require that we view everything outside the scripture as necessarily false. Some people do exactly that, particularly when it comes to other scripture like material from the days of old. If it were true, why did the early church not include it in the canon, some may ask. The Book of Enoch is understood by scholars to be one of the most many apocalyptic writings that come out of the Second Temple period of Hebrew history. Part of what makes these books relevant to those who study the Bible today is the fact that they are written in a similar manner to our, as to our New Testament, containing similar language, terminology, and doctrines. Most scholars also classify many of these writings as pseudopigrapha. Pseudo means not genuine. This is because it seems to have been a common practice, they say, to find writings penned under the names of famous or widely known figures from the past. There are many reasons why this practice was supposedly done. So they believe these writings were not actually written by Enoch since he lived several thousand years earlier than they have dated this book. Well, for the larger part of church history, the book of Enoch was lost to the church. The early church period, after the apostle had it, with even some sects of the church, like the Ethiopic branch, holding it as indeed sacred and part of their canon. It was considered a scripture in the Epistle of Barnabas, and by many of the early church fathers, such as Anthagoras, Justin Mito, and the Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Ignus, and Tertullum. Sorry for saying them wrong. Who called the book of Enoch Holy Scripture, and who wrote C200, attaining to Christ. In looking at another of the reasons why the book was rejected by some, I found what I think is an amazing quote from the author Joseph Blimken, who is not a protest, but states this about the church history. Since any book stands to be interpreted in many views, Enoch posed problems for some theologians. Instead of re-examining their own theology, they sought to dispose of what that which went to counter their belief. Enoch, I believe to point to the consummation of the age of conjuncture with Christ's second coming, which some believe took place in 70 AD in the destruction of Jerusalem. Joseph B. Limkin, the books of Enoch, the angels, the watchers, and the Nephilim, page 16. 
His implications here seems to be saying that some in the early days of the church believed that the second coming was in 70 AD, like the golden age is done. The thousand years with Christ is done. Sadly, he does not develop that or explain any further as to where he's pulling this tidbit of information from. He goes on to mention that the 70 generations discussed in Enoch was a problem for scholars too, because they thought indeed it could be not be stretched beyond the first century, like kind of the troubles people about Daniel's 70 weeks. So in the end, we find it to begin being discredited after the Council of Lodicodia, and then later the Church Fathers denied the canonology of the book. Some either considered the letter of Jude uncanonical because it refers to the apocryphal work. The book eventually fell from the view of for almost 2,000 years and was only rediscovered and published in English at the turn of the 19th century. A short side note, when I was researching some additional info on the 70 generations mentioned at Enoch, I stumbled upon a general forum discussion on religion, found someone who was struggling with this issue. He said, in Enoch it predicts that Methuselah, sorry, in Enoch it predicts Messiah will arise 70 generations after Enoch, seventh from Adam. This is in itself would be harnessed if Enoch was just a fairy tale, but in Luke's genealogy of Jesus, there are indeed 70 from Enoch to Jesus. It seems that A, Enoch correctly predicted it, B, Luke modified the genealogy here and there to make it match Enoch, or C, Enoch is again taking from it Luke. Something is going on here. If Luke just made something up like that, how can we be sure he didn't just make up or borrow things from older, not inspired texts as he saw fit? What also seems a bit troubling is that Enoch says the judgment will occur 70 generations after Enoch. At the time of Christ, Christ says he would never return before that generation had passed away. Again, fitting with Enoch. So here we have another conundrum. Either A, Christ was a false prophet, or B, the pretest interpretation is, cor is correct, and he somehow returned before the generation ended. The two things to note, he may indeed be be correct in implying that Luke, as first century writer, may have been borrowing from the book of Enoch, as we will be looking into further as we go. Secondly, it's worth noting that based on his study of the things of the book, he was beginning to show leanings towards uh, Peter Tress's interest understanding of things. Back on the topic, after falling from view for almost 2,000 years, when the book of Enoch was rediscovered, it, it was actually assumed that it must have been writing that was penned some time after the Christian era. The main reason for this was because it had so many quotes, paraphrases and concepts that were found in the New Testament. However, this view changed after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ten fragments from the Book of Enoch were found among the scrolls, which led some scholars to believe the book may have been used widely as a prayer book, teacher's manual or study text. But its inclusion within the Dead Sea Scrolls reveals that the book was actually in existence before the time of Christ, as Lumpkin puts it. The Dead Sea Scrolls forced a closer look and reconsideration. It became obvious the New Testament did not influence the Book of Enoch. On the contrary, the Book of Enoch influenced the New Testament. There are actually three books of Enoch that you can find that you'll find out there, but I'll only be discussing the first of these three. It's commonly known as the Ethiopic Book of Enoch, or the first Enoch. It contains 107 chapters, which scholars divide the book into five main sections. The first 36 chapters is commonly known as the Book of Watchers and describes the activities surrounding the Genesis 6 proclamation between the sons of God and the daughters of man and Enoch being taken to heaven in relation to the judgment for that. Second two is chapters 37 to 71, referring to the Book of Parables, and it is usually the centre of debate among scholars. It relates to the Book of Watchers, but it contains the development of ideals, ideas surrounding the final judgment of those even outside the fallen angels discussed in section 1. It is also where we see the appearance of the person referred to with the terms sons of man, righteous one, chosen one, and Messiah. Chapters 72 to 82 are known as the astrological book, and it describes the knowledge revealed during Enoch's trip to heaven regarding the movements of the heavenly bodies, bodies the firmament, and the solar calendar. Chapters 80 to 3 to 90 are referred to as the book of dream visions. It describes the visions of history of Israel down through the interesting period. It is for the reason that many scholars conclude that the Book of Enoch, or at least this section of it, may have been written during the intertransformational period, and not earlier since it contained history only up until that time. The Ethiopic Church, though, held the book was held this book was indeed written before the flood. 
And this section was indeed prophetic visions of things to come. Chapters 83 to 84 deal with fixed vision, dealing with the events surrounding the deluge, and 85 to 90 is history of the world up through the establishment of the Masonic Kingdom. Mesoanic. The final chapters, 91 to 107, are referred to as the Epistle of Enoch, the Book of Rewardings, the Blessings of Enoch, which are usually further broken down into five covered topics, exhaustion, apocalypse of weeks, epistle, and the birth of Noah, and the conclusion. As I mentioned earlier, the Book of Enoch is considered one of the writings known as Apolic. There are many Hebrew writings that are outside the canon of Scripture, as writer Michael Stone puts it. Many of these writings are very much concerned with, especially, I can't say that word, matters, the imminence of the end of days and the way men should act in the last period preceding that end. Moreover, the end of days was not just seen as a chance event, but was understood as having been fixed in advance and as a whole concourse of history from creation. Michael Stone, Scriptures, Secrets, Sex and Visions, a profile of Judaism from Ezra to the Jewish Revolts, page 61. So for those who thrive on type studies, these types of books should sound fascinating to us, right? I'll admit that it is one of the key reasons I started looking into them. And it was actually Brother Ed Stevens who sold me the first copy of the book of Enoch, so blame him for leading me down this path. Let me take a brief stop here and chase a rabbit tail. There's a doctrinal theory out there that states the Bible does not teach determined set plan of Yahweh, but that things are open-ended, dependent on man's actions and reactions, and that the many results are not known, not even totally known to Yahweh. This is basically the view of open theism. A few months ago, I was in discussion on Facebook with someone within our, I can't say that word, sorry, that I would have considered to well to be well read. He was espousing this view of open theism, going on about how Hebrew people didn't believe in the view of Yahweh as being a deterministic God. He knew everything about the future. I granted to him that maybe while strictly considering it from the only canon of Hebrew scriptures, his view may appear to have credence, but this, that it fails miserably to be put in the light that even a larger amount of ancient Hebrew writings like the pseudopigraphal and instrumental writings. His response was that he'd never read any of them. So here is a person spouting off and belittling others, especially those holding to predestination type of views, and speaking in an authoritative manner about the historic beliefs of Hebrews, yet on his own admission he is ignorant of all but a few of their writings. Real scholarship comes by a fairly thorough look at the wealth of such information before coming to such concrete conclusions as he was doing. If the Hebrews indeed, indeed had a totally open view of history and Yahweh's knowledge of it, then the whole realm of prophecy is almost useless as it always subject to the change due to the man thought and hope for outcome, this fellow even stated that if Yahweh had been unsuccessful in convincing Moses to act on his behalf, then he would have raised up someone else to do the task. I don't know about you, but I find such a view to be extremely radical, thoroughly unbiblical. Author Michael Edward Stone summarizes the position by someone somewhat agreeing that looking straight, strictly at some of the Hebrew scriptures, the events of history appear to be contingent on the action of man, but he then continues. And many of the pseudepigrapha, however, a determinism is clearly presented. God fixed the times in advance. They cannot be, they can be calculated by him at least. Human action is of no weight in determining the course of history. Moreover, these views were conceived under the very strong impression of the dualistic opposition of the world to come and this world. So either Yahweh's people had total flipping of their opinion and their view and writing on Yahweh over the time, or the terministic nature of the Hebrew scriptures had been misunderstood by us. I am one who already sees much determinism throughout the scriptures already, so finding in it these old other writings is not such a change of position at all. But now back to the path on hand. What benefit does the book of Enoch provide for us when it, our, when it comes to our canon of scripture? Well... The most obviously answer comes from one of its primary uses by people today, and there's a relation to the ongoing debate of the true meaning of Genesis 6 and the sons of God taking daughters of men as wives. The book of Enoch obviously sees the sons of God as indeed angelic entities, procreating with human women, creating hybrid races of giants. This is a common view in Genesis 6 that the ancient Hebrews and early church had, and the book of Enoch is key source for further promoting this understanding. When it comes to this book in general, some quote it as if it was scripture, while others condemn it 
is total myth and heresy. But if we find that it has been influential on some biblical writers and it has influenced them in writing of our canon or scripture, then it would demand further consideration, would it not? Let's start with a look at what little we know about the man Enoch just from the scriptures. Genesis 5 tells us Enoch is the son of Jared and that at the age of 65 he had a son Methuselah and that he lived another 300 years after fathering Methuselah. And at that time, at the age of 365, he was not, for God took him. So the fact that we are told that he was no more age of 365, a lifespan that pales in comparison to those of the time living hundreds of years longer, this gives us a clue to something that is different here. We are told he walked with God, which carries the connotation of a direct and intermediate relationship with God. Enoch's walk with God was different to the, than those around him. In Genesis 6, 9, we are told that Noah similarly walked with God, and we know how special he ended up being. And as special as Noah was, Enoch was likewise special. Note that we are not told he died, as all of those around him in the genealogy verses are said to have done, but it's just that he was not. This is the only time in genealogy chapter that was not is used. Scholars agree it cannot mean simply that he died. And of course, we are told in the book of Hebrews that he had indeed not died in this instance. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Hebrews 11.5 Beyond that, the only mentionable content about Enoch we have is in the book of Jude, which we will deal further in a bit. It states, It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Aaron, prosophized, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of the ungodliness in which they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against. Jude 14.15 As mentioned in the book of Enoch, was high in high esteem in the other Christian church. By translator E. Isaac concluded, the book fell in disfavor around the 4th century in the West due to the negative reviews of influential theologians like Julius, Africus, Augustine, Hilary, and Jerome, and that it was the medieval mind that was responsible for it becoming virtually oblivious to the church until rediscovery in 1773 by Scottish explorer James Bruce. Now we have to look into that, James Bruce. Some believe it fell in disfavour because the text was at the time manipulated by those in the Mountarian heresy camp, and therefore Jerome and Augustine outright dismissed it as popular because of its popularity. Not any spiritual basis, though. It was Augustine, with his early background in Mountarianism, sorry for saying that word wrong, that it was the most influential with his rejection, and he laid up the foundation for the modern church's continued rejection. Brian Gontwetter sums it up well, stating, but we must learn our lessons from Augustine's fallacy of guilt by association. Just because some abhorrent sects of non-Christian cults may value one Enoch does not make it an unworthy text, especially since it has long pedigree of acceptance with historical Orthodox faith. After all, non-Christian cults of all kinds do the same thing with the Bible. Abuse of text does not negate proper use. Brian Godwana, where giants fell upon the earth, page 18. Now, while we're not saying one Enoch is to be considered scripture, many people do not even realize just how influential it was on our New Testament writers, some of whom appear to use it directly as a source material for doctrines that they then injected into what we today hold as the canon of scripture. Say that the book of Enoch as a non-canonical writing was a source of historical and doctrine truth is not odd as thought as it may sound to some. Scholars note that there are well over 50 references in scriptures to just over 20 non canonical use source texts used by biblical authorities that are currently still lost to history. Those are non-biblical texts that writers of scripture can specifically mention as being either the source of truths for the information they wrote in the scripture or a promoted or suggested reading for further truth and references for what they wrote in scripture. A few examples of such mentioned works would be the Book of Wars of Yahweh, Numbers 21 to 14. The Book of Joshua, Joshua 13. The Book of Acts of Solomon, 1 Kings 11:41. The Book of Annals of the Kings of Israel, 1 Kings 14:9. The Book of Annals of King Judah, 1 Kings 14:29. The Annals of Samuel the Sir, 1 Chronicles 29:29. 29, 29. The History of Nathan the Prophet, 2 Chronicles 9:29. 9, 9. 
and many others, but you get the gist of the point being made. Basically, with such evidence of acknowledgement of non biblical sources by the very writers of the scripture canon, we can simply cannot dismiss such influential texts as totally irrelevant of unworthy inspection. Unfortunately, at present, all these types of work remain lost, except one, the Book of Enoch. And the fact is, the book was considered to be one such source that contains writing information and both direct and indirect influence of our New Testament writings. The Book of Enoch would have been one of those books that would probably be wide read by the Jewish people of the first century. It appears to be one that was obviously known by most people, as we find the New Testament not only directs quotes here and there, but quite a large amount of direct allusions to doctrines expressed within it. Terms like son of man, for instance. Many simply say this terminology that Joshua employs is harking back to its appearance in Daniel 7, and there is no denying that there are obviously connections. However, what little are we told in Daniel regarding that designation does not directly correlate to the extensive use we find throughout the New Testament. One scholarly work argues that while Daniel 7 shows the vision Son of Man in a cloud approaching the throne of the Ancient of Days and receiving the Kingdom of Glory and Dominion, the New Testament Son of Man engages in a more judicial office that one is one presented in Daniel. In Daniel, he is enthroned after judgment, but in places like Mark 8.38 and Matt 10.32-33, the Son of Man comes in judgment. This difference aligns with much more closely to the teachings contained in the parables of Enoch. What Mark 13.26-27 tells us, The sons of man text goes beyond what Daniel 7 states, but aligns more closely with the re- resurrection imagery contained in 1 Enoch 56.61-62. and 62. Another example we can look at is the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew twenty five thirty one to 46 When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats, and he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on his left, Matthew twenty five thirty one to 33 He goes on to speak of those who did this, that and other things and those who did not do any of these things. And that concludes in verse 46 by stating, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, while Daniel 7 gives us reference to the kingly throne idea, it does not present us with any kind of real judgment of nations motive like we hear here. However, this type of motive is indeed reflective of what we are told in the book of Enoch in chapter 62, where we are told the gathering of people for judgment. One half of the portion of them shall silence, shall glance at the other half. They shall be terrified and dejected, and pain shall seize them when they see the Son of Man sitting on his throne in glory. But the Lord of Spirits himself will cause them to be frantic, so that they shall rush and depart from his presence. So he will deliver them to the angels for punishment and order that the vengeance shall be executed on them, oppressors of his children and his elect ones. The righteous and the elect ones shall be saved on that day, and from then forth they shall never see the faces of the sinners and the oppressors. The Lord of the man of the spirits will abide over them. They shall eat and rise, rest and rise with the Son of Man forever and ever. The righteous and the elect ones shall rise from the earth and cease being downcast face. They shall wear garments of glory. How about we learn about John 5, about judgment and the Son? The Father judges no one's, but has given all judgment to the Son. John 5.22 Sounds almost like a direct quote from Enoch 6.9 And he sat on the throne of his glory, and the sum of judgment was given to the Son of Man. Enoch 69.27 Now let's take a brief look briefly at some of the book of Revelations. Let's start with the discussion of the blood of the martyrs in Revelation 6. When he opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a large voice, O sovereign Lord, holy true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Enoch had foretold this similar manner. In those days the prayer of the righteous shall have ascended, and the blood of the righteous from the earth shall be before the Lord of spirits. In those days the holy ones who dwell above in the heavens shall unite with one voice and supplicate the prayers and praise and give thanks and bless in the name of the Lord of spirits on behalf of the blood of the righteous 
who has been shed, and that the prayer of the righteous may not be in vain for the Lord of the spirits, that he may have justice, and that they may ha- not have to wait forever. 1 Enoch 47, 1, 2. Are we sure we're all familiar with what we're told in Revelation 20? Then I saw a great white throne, and him who seated on it from his presence, earth, the sky filled away, and no place was found for him. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were open, then another book was open. This is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelations twenty twelve fifteen. Well, this correlates pretty closely with what we find at Enoch forty seven and fifty one. In those days, I saw the head of dead. Uh, sorry, in those days, I saw the head of days when he seated himself on the throne of his glory, and the books of the living were opened before him, and all his hosts, which were in heaven above, and his consulates, which stood before him. And the hearts of the holy were filled with joy because the number of the righteous had been offered and the prayer of the righteous had been heard and the blood of the righteous not been required before the Lord of the Spirits. 1 Enoch 47, 3, 4. And in those days the earth shall, and in those days shall the earth give, also give back which has been entrusted to it and shall also give back that which it has rejected. And hell shall gave back which it owes, for in those days the elect one shall arise, and he shall choose the righteous and holy from among them, for the day has drawn near that they shall be saved. One Enoch fifty one, uh, one Enoch five one, one two. So here is a question that hit me while I was studying it, and it's a question worth pondering, I think. If we accept the book of Revelation as an inspired canon of Scripture, which we do, and if we understand it as a prophecy revealed beforehand to John, which we do, then what do we do when we find a very similar or identical prophetic scenarios in the book Enoch, written hundreds of years earlier than Revelation? But that correlates with it, just food for thought. Another example of the Son of Man theme is that beyond what we're told in one in Daniel can be found on one Enoch forty eight. And at the hour that the Son of Man was named in the presence of the Lord of the Spirits, even before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of the Spirits, and he shall be a staff to the righteous, and they shall steady themselves and not fall, and he shall be a light of the Gentiles, and the hope of those who are troubled of heart, 1 Enoch 48, 2-4. Could it be that Paul was drawing from this Enochian storyline when in Romans he speaks of such things? So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous, Romans 11, 11. And then he goes on to discuss Gentiles coming to faith alongside the remnant, i.e. the righteous who study themselves in Christ, so as not to fall. Hopefully you are starting to see that there are uncanny amounts of similarities presented in the book Enoch. There are many other examples of parallel language scenarios found in the book Enoch. Not all of them are necessarily so much full of expression of whole scenarios as we have seen. Some are simply key terms and references that are not clearly seen in the Hebrew scriptures. These types of thoughts or terminology are influential in how we now view the key doctrines that the church holds sacred. On this topic, writer E. Isaacs concludes, There is little doubt that one Enoch was influential in moulding the New Testament doctrines concerning that the nature of the Messiah, Son of Man, the Messianic Kingdom, demonology, the future resurrection, the final judgment, the whole extratical theatre, the symbolism. No wonder, therefore, that the book was highly regarded by many of his early apostate and church fathers. E. Isaac, a new translation and introduction of the Old Testament. Pseudopigrapha. One of the earliest experts on Enoch and other pseudopigrapha writings was R. H. Charles. He went on to list about 60 examples where language of the New Testament reflected possible Enochian influence, then coming to the conclusion that one Enoch has more influence on the New Testament than any other acryphal or pseudopigraphal work. 
R. H. Charles Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament, Volume 2. Let us now look at sampling some of the terminology parallels between the New Testament and 1 Enoch that Charles presents. Again, these are mostly terms and ideas that are found in the New Testament with no real Hebrew scripture correlation, but are almost directly pulled from Enoch 1. <laughs> New Testament, John 1, 7, walk in the light, Enoch 92, 4, walk in the light. John 1 John 2, 8, darkness is past, Enoch 58, 5, darkness is past. So you can see they are very similar. Very similar. Acts 3.14, the righteous one, Christ, and then Enoch 53.6, the righteous one, and elect, Messiah. Luke 9.35, this is my son, the elect one, Enoch 1.45, the elect one, Messiah, and Enoch 1.49.2, mine, elect one. This last one here in Luke is a bit of little bit more interesting than in how it is listed in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark in those two versions of the story. It is essentially just says, this is my son, listen to him. Here in Luke, we have the addition of the term, the elect one, as Lumpkin puts it. The elect one is a more significant term found 14 times in the book of Enoch. If the book was indeed known as to the apostles of the church, with its abundant descriptions of the elect one who should sit upon the throne of glory, and the elect one who should dwell in the midst of them, then the great spiritual authenticity is justly accorded in the book of Enoch. Then the voice out of the cloud tells the apostles, this is my son, the elect one. The one promise in the book of Enoch, Joseph B. Lumpkin, Books of Enoch, Angels in the Watches, the Nephilim, page 15. Now, list of these kinds of comparisons go on, but hopefully these give you an uh, idea of some of the similar language and thoughts originating for the Book of Enoch. Another interesting point of view is that the scholars have noticed is that in some instances we find some terms that have had one understanding in how they were presented or amplified in the Hebrew Scripture, but then those terms have taken on a different meaning and understanding in one Enoch. And then it became that new understanding that was presented in Enoch and that was brought over into the New Testament. R. H. Charles argues that things like the notion of shoal demiology, the future life, which are barely mentioned in Hebrew scriptures, are given more light and expanded upon in one Enoch, and this expanded view corresponds to the New Testament usage. Now, before I get to the bulk of what I like to cover, I like to want to take a quick look at the idea of the Messiah and what the book of Enoch reveals about him. We know in Hebrew scripture that we have fairly clouded view of who or what he was to be, yet we have a much clearer view on once Christ comes to the scene. So now let's consider that we what we know about the Messiah from the canon of scripture and consider it in with the, what the book of Enoch tells us about him. These are scattered bits of information through Enoch and R.H. Charles has done the legwork, pull them together to a more cohesive view much of what Enoch says about the coming Messiah. From the book of Enoch, we find that Messiah was going to be not of human descent, but supernatural being, um, given four titles to be used in the first time at Enoch, and then in UT, the Christ, the Righteous One, the Elect One, and the Son of Man. Judge the world of the re reveler of all things, Masonic champion, Mas Masonic, sorry for saying these wrongs, a judge who possesses righteousness, wisdom, power, the Righteous One in extraordinary sense, Possessor of righteousness, and it dwells within him. Has wisdom which could find no dwelling place on earth. Wisdom dwells in him, and the spirit of him who gives knowledge. Secrets of wisdom steam forth from his mouth. Wisdom pours forth like water before him. In him abodes the spirit of power. Possesses un universal dominion. Is the revealer of all things. His appearance reveals the revelation of good and unmasking evil, brings light to everything hidden, brings life to those who have perished in the land and sea and those in shoal. Evil, when unmasked, will vanish from his presence. All judgment has been committed to him. He will sit on the throne in his glory, which is likewise the throne of God. All, right, all men righteous and wicked and angels he will judge. By the words of his mouth he will slay the ungodly. He is, the slay, he is the stay of the righteousness, the avenger of the life of the righteousness, the preserver of righteousness and the inheritance. 
He will vindicate the earth as possession for the righteous, cause the face of the righteous to shine with joy. He will cover the righteous with life. He will make the righteous resplendent with life. He will make the righteous become angels in heaven. He will abide in closest communion with the righteous forever and will be in immediate presence of Yahweh, the Lord of spirits, and his glory is forever and ever to his might to all generations. Haven't you see how closely things are mentioned in the book of Enoch are with what we see and believe from what we have learned in the New Testament about the Messiah. Now moving away from the Messiah character directly and placing him in an overarching prophecy of the works of Son of Man and history, we find many more similarities on what we find in the New Testament. The watchers, the angels, fell and led mankind astray. They were punished immediately, bound for judgments, held to await final judgment, in the meantime, mankind sins and denies the Lord of Spirits. Kings and the mighty trust in their scepter and glory. They oppress the elect of the children of God. Prayer of the righteous ascends, their blood crying for vengeance. Suddenly the head of days will appear with the Son of Man. Judgment is declared on all for declaring their deeds. Fallen angels cast into the fiery furnace. Kings and men given destruction as they burn and vanish away. They are tortured in Gena by the angels of punishment. Other sinners driven from the face of the earth. Son of man slays them with word of his mouth. Sins banished, heaven and earth transformed. Righteous and elect have their mansions therein. The Lord of the Spirit shines upon them. They live in the light of eternal light. They seek after light. They find righteousness and place with the Lord of Spirits. They grow in knowledge and righteousness. Surely you can see the storyline from Enoch is likewise presented, playing out the New Testament scriptures. It is no wonder why these 17th century readers of the rediscovered book of Enoch supposed it to have been written after the New Testament. The parallels are almost uncanny. Now let's return to our attention to the passage in Jude, what we mentioned in the first lecture. This is one of the first few stronger passages that show an even clearer dependence of the Enochian text. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes when ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodly for the, all of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and all of the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude fourteen fifteen. This is direct quoting from en 1 Enoch 9. Oh, this is direct quoting from 1 Enoch 1 9. But one thing worth noting is that Jude states here what Enoch is doing in the verse is prophesizing, referring to a verse from Enoch is about, as about being a prophecy, sure feels like he's adding much more weight to it than if it was worth quoting it as a secular type source like we see occasionally in scripture. The other thing that is notable in studying the both books further is that Jude does not simply quote a verse and move on, but in fact continues to follow the continent patterns, content patterns of one Enoch along with allusions and echoes of its phrases and languages throughout its letter. Both books share the primary uh, apocalyptic theme of the punishment of the ungodly and they both do so by pointing to evil in their day and stating it as a fulfillment of a past prophetic proclamation. Not only do both books appeal to the ancient judgment examples as a connection to the promised judgment coming to the present ungodly company, but they both look back to the same ancient corruption of angelic watchers who corrupted humanity. 1 Enoch chapters 136, of course, in deal in great detail with the watchers of, that Jude touch, touches upon. And in Jude 13, he condemns the wandering stars, which is common Hebrew idiom in both Hebrew scriptures and pseudepigrapha, that is, referring to divine beings. They are also referred to as hosts of heaven, a term which denotes deity. We also find that the stars of heaven refer to the heavenly hosts, which are likened to pagan deities, Deuteronomy 4.19, as well as those angelic sons of God that surround his throne, Psalms 89-5-7, Job 38-7. So it is of no surprise that Enoch discusses those fallen angelic watches using the imagery of the imprisoned stars. The angel said to me, this place is the ultimate end of heaven and earth, which is the prison house for the stars and the powers of heaven. 
They are the ones which have transgressed the commandments of God. 1 Enoch 18, 14 to 15. So Jude pulls that similar theme in which he condemns those wandering stars by saying it is for them that the gloom of the outer darkness has been reserved forever. Verse 13. And Jude speaks of these ungodly villains, of those who revert the grace of God into sensuality and denying our only Master and Lord, Joshua the Christ. 4. This aligns with the declaration against the angels found in 1 Enoch 67.10 where it says, So judgment shall come upon them because they believe in the debauchery of their bodies and deny the spirit of your wife. 1 Enoch 67.10 this theme of fleshly defilement and of the rejection of authority that Jude mentions in verse 8 are likewise the traits of those angels in verse 6 that did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, who are angels mentioned in Jude. Who are the angels mentioned in Jude? It is plainly evident, as some scholars point out, that Jude is obviously pulling directly from 1 Enoch chapter 6 to 19 being the earliest existing manuscript that holds the account of the fall of the angelic watchers, Enoch plainly states in taking, talking to the fallen watchers, Wherefore have ye left the high, holy, eternal heaven, and laid with women, and defiled yourself with the daughters of men, taking yourselves wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants, as your sons? And though you were holy, spiritual, living, eternal life, you have defiled yourself with the blood of women, and have begotten children with the blood of flesh, and as the children of men have lusted after the flesh and blood of those also who die and perish. 1 Enoch 15, 3 to 5. Of those watches you sin, Jude says they were kept in eternal chains under the gloomy darkness until judgment of the great day, which is closely connected with 1 Enoch 10, 12. Bind them fast for 70 generations in the valleys of earth till the day of their judgment and their consummation till their judgment is that for ever and ever is consumed in those days they shall be led off to the abyss of fire to the torment and to the prison in which they shall be confined to for ever 1 Enoch 10 13 to 14 a quick note while looking at this verse in which we was touched upon earlier when mentioning that the foreign post we have here that the angels were held for 70 generations and at the end of which time there would be day of judgment. In the Gospel of Luke, he counts 70 generations leading up to their present time and the time of Christ. Christ said the judgment would occur within his generation, being the 70th generation, thus correlating Enoch's prediction time frame. And the book of Revelation, which discusses the tossing of the devil and his angels into the lake of fire, likewise lines up with what Enoch tells us about the events surrounding the judgment and the timing of the first century. All of this combined just shows us an additional confirmation for the timing of an event that was to take place in the first century time frame. Not thousands of years later or in the future as many teach today. <clears throat> it's been and done, it's happened. Now, when it comes to Jude 6 and 7, there are a couple of ways you can look at the connection. Some modern commentators go through the motions to disconnect any idea of the two verses of being comparisons to each other. They say these two verses are just examples, two examples of judgment and not being compared to each other. They will contend that verse 6 speaks of these angels which sometimes attempt to make out as mere men and not heavenly body beings. Then And then they say that Verse 7 is speaking about the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah being compared to those cities that surrounded them. So when it says that they, and like men are indulged, it is referring to those surrounding cities indulging in like, like men to what Sodom and Gomorrah had done. You know, they recently found um, the old town in the Dead Sea through satellite images that were taken in the 80s. Sadly, such interpretation does not hold up when examined strictly by the original text, but it also, even more, for fails when considered in light to other second, second te temple texts that Jude is obviously pulling from. What we have here is a condemnation of heavenly angelic beings who left their heavenly abode and sinned and held for judgment. We then have comparison of sin to those angels in verse 7. Let's see it together. 
and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day jude six just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulge in sexual immorality, persuade in unnatural desire, serve as an example of undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So we have angels sinning, and then, just like them, we have a group, a single group, being discussed. The collective group of Sodom and Gomorrah, the surrounding cities, and what about them? They, Sodom and Gomorrah, the surrounding cities, likewise, and also some translations have it in like manner, they indulged in sexual morality, pursued unnatural desire in like the manner of to whom. The angel were angels in the perverse verse. So what we have here is telling on how the angels, as well as Sodom and Gomorrah in their cities, were all guilty of indulging in sexual morality. We see this connection clearly displayed in the second temple writings, such as Do not become like Sodom, which departed from order of nature. Likewise, the watchers departed from nature's order, and the Lord pronounced a curse upon them at the flood. Thou didst destroy those who aforetime did in equity, among whom were giants, trusting in their strength and boldness, bringing upon them a boundless flood of water. Thou did burst up with fire and brimstone, the men of sort of workers of arrogance, who had become known for all of their crimes, and did make them example of those who should come after. 3 Maccabees 2, 4, 5 Let them not take themselves wives from our daughters of Canaan, for the seed of Canaan will be rooted out of the land. And he told them of how the judgment of the giants and the judgment of the Sodomites and how they had been judged on account of their wickedness and had died on account of their fornication and uncleanliness and their mutual corruption through fornication. Jubilees 24, 5 so hopefully you can now see the connecting of the angelic judgment with the judgment upon Sodom and surrounding cities is not unique to Jude, but is indeed just something Jude has accurately borrowed from non-alchemical writings, and that in all plays both groups are mentioned together and labelled as being guilty of similar acts. This should help. This should also. So that this should also help solidify the argument that the two verses in Jude are indeed being used in comparison to one another, and that indeed the likewise in Jude 7 is calling back to compare to verse 6, and the sin of the angels for indulging likewise in sexual morality. To sum up, I appreciate the way Brian Godwire put it. Jude's liking of Sodom within the days of Noah and the sexual sin of the watchers is a literary doublet that reinforces the Echinochian watcher prelude. Combined with the other Echinochian allusions, echoes, and the linguistic memes in Jude, this certainly provides a preponderant of evidence of the extensive dependency of Jude upon one Enoch, far beyond the single quotation of verses 14 to 15. Now I turn attention to 2 Peter 2, 4, 11. For if God did not spare angels when they sin, but cast them into hell and commit them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued the righteous lot, greatly distressed by their sensual conduct of the wickedness, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the right righteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion, despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme in the glorious one, whereas the angels the greater in the might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before a Lord. 2 Peter, 20, uh, 2 Peter 4, 11. As we found in Jude, we have angels who sinned and were cast into chains awaiting judgment, followed by a mention of Noah, which reveals to us the timing of the sinning of the angels was prior to the flood, and this is then followed again by mentioning a connection with Sodom's destruction. He also connects that to the lust of defiling passion and despising the authority in his own time. 
While this section is usually understood by scholars as borrowing from the Jude passage, note that Peter adds a bit more to it than Jude, and the extra information he mentioned adds more to it than the obvious connection between this verse and the book of Enoch as his source. Peter says not only that the angels were in chains awaiting judgment, but they were in chains and cast to hell. Now the word here translates hell is actually being translated as Tartarus, not Gina, which is typically used for the English word hell. The name of the subterranean region, doleful and dark, regarded as in ancient Greeks as an abode of the wicked dead, where they suffer punishment for their evil deeds. Tartarus is considered as to be the deepest location in Shoal. The Greeks taught that the gigantic titans were chained and held there. Enoch, however, says that this place is where the ancient, fallen angels, the watchers, were chained and held for judgment. Now they shall say unto themselves, Our souls are fulfilled, are full of unrighteous gang, but it does not prevent us from descending from the midst of their wrath into the burden of a shoal. And after that their faces shall be filled with darkness and shame before the Son of Man, and they shall be driven from his presence, and the sword shall abide before his face in their midst. Thus spark those that spoke of the Lord of Spirits, this is the audience and judgment with respect to the mighty and the kings and the exalted and those who possess the earth before the Lord of Spirits. And the other forms I saw hidden in that place, I heard the voice of the angel saying, These are the angel who descended to earth and revealed what was hidden to the children of man, seduced the children of man into committing sin. 1 Enoch 63, 10-64, 1. So we have Peter, who is considered to be borrowing from Jude, but could be himself borrowing directly from Enoch, since we see he adds this additional element not in Jude. The end result is we have two sections of the Holy Scripture that is clearly borrowing from the book of Enoch for their doctrinal basis that is now part of the canon of the Scripture. Also note, in neither instances do they attempt to fix or correct the view of the watchers procreating with women view but actually add comments that favour from the view of Genesis 6. But wait, there's more. Flipping back to Peter's first letter, chapter 3, we find yet another connection. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. 1 Peter 3, 18-20 So we have spirits in prison, and they are tied to, or originating from events surrounding and preceding Noah and the flood. And what events are we told in Scripture directly preceded the flood time period? Of course, Genesis 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took their wives, and they, any they chose. Nephilim were on earth in these days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, Genesis 6, 1, 2. Now this is why I researched this, because um, exceedingly abundantly was talking about the sons of man and everything, and I've just been researching the topic a bit more. So the Lord said, I will blot out man who I created from the face of the land, man and animals, creeping things, the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, 7, 8. And of course, the book of Enoch fills the gaps with the story of what happened around the time period, and of which we have seen some of the New Testament writers have references reference from in their writings. Never once is there any attempt made to correct people on Genesis 6, watches with women idea. The verse in Peter is a verse that has perplexed scholars for some time. Many ideas have been discussed behind whom these spirits are, where they were, and what was being preached to them. Finding answers to this dilemma is clearly almost impossible by Rallying strictly on a canon of scripture, and hopefully by now you are starting to see that even the author Peter was not solely relying on what we consider canon of scripture. The spirits here originate as being from Noah's day, imprisoned or bound, surrounded that time frame, and 
this idea lines up nicely from what we have already seen in 1 Enoch 10. Also, the disobedient angels who were bound and imprisoned in Shoal till the judgment. Beyond the creation, some scholars even lay out how the book of 1 Peter reflects the great influence from the Enochian literature, literature throughout. In his commentary on Enoch, Nixon, Nicholsburg actually lays out a chart showing a multitude of corresponding ideas and tomes between the entirely 1 Peter and 1 Enoch 108. Here are some examples of this list. 1 Peter 3.12, those who do evil. 1 Enoch 108, 2.6.10, those who do evil. So you can see here, they're, they're very similar. So when it comes to the book of 1 Enoch, we have manuscripts that have a long history of acceptance in varying degrees within ancient people of Yahweh up to through the early centuries of church history. One of many books explicably mentioned excuse me, within the canon of scripture it is the only one we currently have in existence that appears to be an original source within it. We get a glimpse into the interpretations that have obviously been influential in many New Testament doctrines that we hold dear. Doctrines surrounding Topics such as the Messiah, the Kingdom, the Son of Man, the Demons, the Final Judgment, and more found here in ways that are more clearly presented than they are found in Hebrew scriptures. And, as we've seen, the views found there have been carried over much to the doctrines as they are presented within the New Testament scriptures. It is understandable that those who hold the canon of scripture in high esteem tend to be uncomfortable with some of the doctrines contained within 1 Enoch, the Watchers, the Giants storyline, as well as detailed ancient cosmology, it all sound so foreign to modern readers, but that was not the case for the early church and the first century writers. I personally have had recent conversations with every type of excuse was given to get around various scriptures in an effort to avoid a clear and historical view on these things, and I can understand the issue, as there are many things that just sound too odd, but we must remember we are approaching these things with a more enlightened and scientifically geared mindset which causes our views to be skewered. Many things of the supernatural and spiritual realm are alien to us today. The more we study ancient Hebrew writings and their understandings as well as their surrounding surround ancient Near East neighbours, the more we find such strange surrounding doctrines to deal with. So what does this all mean to us? Why am I bringing up this topic? Well, I told you I just brought it up because of the Sons of Man was discussed, but not the writer, why did the writer bring it up? Well, most people don't don't read the instrumental and pseudepigraphal writings. Feelings, they offer little or nothing to the Christian. Hopefully, I have at least opened your eyes to some, in some way, small way, to see how, in fact, at least one writing was very influential in the doctrines we find in, propagated in the New Testament that shaped the theological belief. That being the case, it would be a great benefit to further study and understand this obvious source of material that the first century writers were pulling from. Yes, there are many other writings from the same period that could have been brought up, some of which can be shown have been influential too, but not clearly as Enoch was. When we study the Bible, we practice sola scriptia, and when we compare scripture to scripture, we are quick to point out that best understanding of the New Testament is found in better understanding of the Hebrew scriptures. We are also use the force of that practice when we debate issues with others, saying that unless our opponent can prove the doctrine from the Old Testament originating source, then their case is weak. Well, if E. Isaac and other scholars were indeed right in saying, as I quoted earlier, that there is little doubt that one Enoch is influential in modern New Testament doctrines concerning the nature of the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Messiah of Judgment, the, the whole historical theater and symbolism, then we may actually have another source of influential theology that needs our attention if we're to gain an even better understanding of some of the New Testament doctrines. If New Testament writers were indeed drawing from or implying doctrinal influence from Enoch and these types of non-canonical instrumental writings, and if these were understandings that altered or expanded upon the Old Testament understandings on a topic, then those different understandings were brought over and applied within our New Testament. Then could it be that we may be missing information in our understanding by ignoring them in our studies? Could the church gain better understanding of the New Testament from also considering the teachings of some of the inter interest oh, sorry, I'm saying that word 
writings, especially ones like Enoch, where influence is also clearly brought into the New Testament. I believe it is a question worth asking. I will close with this, this closing paragraph from Godwin's book. But the preponderance of evidence shows that not only does the New Testament letter of Jude quote directly from 1 Enoch 1, Book of Watches, but the entire letter in its alternative version in 2 Peter shows sign of literary and theological dependence on the rest of the Book of Watches, chapters 1 to 36, as well as chapter 80, the Book of Lumerians, 46, Book of Parables, and the chapter 100, Epistle of Enoch. 2 Peter shows evidence of structural and thematic dependency on 1 Enoch 17 to 22 and 108. But the fact is, the entire New Testament shows a multitude of allusions and linguistic echoes of the entire corpus of 1 Enoch. That one can safely say the book and its basic interpretations may not be scripture, but are surely legitimized by the Bible and therefore worthy of a study and highly regarded by the Christian Church. Brian Godwa when giants were upon the earth, page 34. <laughs> so there, 101, cool, what a time. All right, so if you're still with me at the end here, I want to say thank you very much. Um, yeah, as I said, I found this while searching about the Son of Man, had a read of it, and thought the Lord pushed me. I wasn't going to share it, but the Holy, Holy Spirit just kept pulling me to it, so I'm sharing it for everyone. So wherever you are in the world, Thank you for watching. You have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Raise your vibrations. Much love. Bye now.